I'm Madam Mombi. I'm going to be taking you through preparation of financial statement. This is the preparation of financial statement for a sole proprietorship, that is a sole trader. A sole trader is someone who is doing business alone and enjoying all the profit alone. So a sole proprietor needs to know whether they are making profit or loss in an organization. They also need to know what is the work of the business in terms of what you call statement or financial position or the balance sheet. So in this tutorial, I am going to be covering how to prepare the trading profit and loss account, also called the income statement, and how to prepare the balance sheet, also called the statement or financial position. So we can start with the trading profit and loss account. So I am going to show you on the format. So we are going to have two columns, both of them in shilling. So we can have column 1 here and column 2 here. So as we have said that uh, an income statement, simply you want to know is my business making profit or loss. Therefore, your starting point is going to be asking yourself how much have I sold or how much is my revenue for a certain period. So the first item you are going to have is the sales. So we are going to begin with the sales, also called revenue, because uh, from sales that is where you get the revenue. And we are going to use X just to represent any figure, because you can have any figure uh, in terms of sales revenue. Then the next question you ask yourself is the once you make the sales, is it possible that some of the customers were not satisfied maybe by the description of the goods, they were not satisfied by the delivery, maybe some of the items were broken and therefore they returned some of the items. If there were any returns from the sales that you had sold, you have to account for the return. Therefore, you are going to say you less any returns. We call them sales returns. Also called return in one. Return in one. So you let, you are subtracting. So conventionally, in accounting, when you subtract, you use bracket to show that you are subtracting. The answer you get is called the net sales. The answer is called net sales. How important is this? This is simply a working on uh, how much you sold, subtracting what was returned or rejected by your customers. Therefore, the uh, remaining amount is the net sales. You want to know whether you made a profit, therefore, you have to ask yourself what was the cost of these sales? How much did I spend to buy the items that I sold? So the next part is to less the cost of sales. So you say less cost of sales. I'm going to underline this because cost of sales is a combination of different things. It starts with opening stock. So you start with opening stock. How much did you have at the beginning? You are going to use the second column now as a matter of format so that we are neat and you are able to see the flow. So you started with opening stock probably of a certain amount, let's assume 50,000. During the year, you also purchased several items with the intention to sell them. So therefore, we are also going to add purchases during the year. You add the purchases. How much did you purchase? And the purchases can be adjusted for different things. For example, the same way you bought, 
You may have found that as you were inspecting the goods after purchasing them, some of them had defects. Some of them were not of the right quality that you ordered. Some of them um, were broken. Therefore, you have to return them to the supplier. So if you make any returns again, you are just for the returns. So you are going to say you less return outward. Outward, return outward, or purchases return, purchases return. So we say when you left, you put in bracket, meaning that you are subtracting. It is also possible that these purchases that you made, you bought your items from a, probably a wholesaler who is not close to your retail place. Therefore, you incur some cost of carriage. And we know that the cost of carrying or the cost of carrying your purchases up to your premises where probably you are making the sales, the cost of carriage shall be a cost of the goods also. So therefore you are going to add what you call carriage inward. The cost that you incur to carry the goods. So you add carriage inward. In case the proprietor or the owner of the business, because you are saying this is a sole proprietorship, in case the proprietor took some goods for personal use, remember in accounting you say that there is what you call a business entity assumption, that the business is separate, distinct and distinguished from the owner. Therefore, the owner's affairs and the business affairs are different. So if the proprietor took some goods, for personal use, you are also going to account for them here and deduct them from the purchases. And then you will taken over by the sole proprietor. And once you want to deduct the goods here from the purchases, remember that you are supposed to add the same goods or the amount of that goods to the drawings. Because it represents that he has withdrawn some of the capital invested by taking the goods. So the adjustment would mean that we subtract here. The amount is taken over by the sole proprietor and we add the same amount to the drawings which we are going to see later in the balance sheet. So, I'm saying that you left goods with the drawn by the sole proprietor. We are subtracting. So all this calculation is going to give us the cost of goods that are available for sale. So the answer there is cost of goods available for sale. Then the cost of goods available for sale, but our intention is to find the cost of sales. Rather, our intention is to get the cost of the goods that were actually sold. Therefore, all these were available for sale, but we did not sell all of them. The reason we know we did not sell all of them is because there is closing stock. So for us to be able to know the amount of goods that were sold, we subtract closing stock. So at this point, you left closing stock. And now the answer you get is what we call the cost of sales. But we do not put it here. We are going to bring it here. This is where you bring the cost of sales. Just below the figure for net sales because our intention is to compare. This is the amount of money we got from the sales. And this is the amount of money we had spent to acquire the goods that we sold. Therefore, we are going to say this net sales minus cost of sales, you minus. And the answer is called gross profit. So the answer is called gross profit. And I repeat that gross profit is the difference between the net sales and the cost of sales, the items that you have sold, giving us gross profit. After this, an organization or the sole proprietor may have other sources of income. So other than the business, 
If we have other sources of income, for example, you may have rent, probably he is a landlord, he has some rental income. So, you are also going to include here other sources or other income. You may have received some discounts, discounts received is an income. So, you are going to put other, other incomes. And other incomes. So any other this business has other incomes, you're going to have number one, you can have discounts received. We can also have rent or income. You can also have uh, what we call decrease in provision of doubtful debt. And this is going to be covered under a topic, or rather a subtopic, which is called end of the year adjustment. The kind of end of year adjustment we talk about are uh, depreciation, we talk about uh, accruals, prepayment. Provision for down to debt. So, one of the incomes that we are going to put here, which shall be discussed at the end of the adjustment, is decrease in provision of down to debt. But I can explain in an action. Decrease in provision of down to debt is whereby you make a provision from one year to another of the amount of debt that you are not sure are going to be recoverable. That is why they are called down to debt. So, if from one year to the other the provision decreases, the amount of decrease, which is the difference between one year and the other, is called a decrease in provision of doubtful debt and is treated as an income. In a labor language, it means that the people you have, or the amount of money you expected to lose has been reduced. Therefore, you have recovered some of it. Therefore, a decrease in provision is an income. So we are going to have here a decrease in provision. Of that student. As an income. So there may be other income, commission received, and all that, but we can concentrate on the few just to represent the others. So the total of adding this to the gross profit is going to give us the gross income. So that is how we get the gross income. Once we have the gross income, now this is how much the business has made. Initially, by just producing and selling, we computed the gross profit. We have also added all the other income that the business was able to get during the year. And now we are at the gross income. But we know that any business has expenses. And so far, we have not accounted for expenses. When I talk about expenses, we are talking about depreciation, discount allowed, salaries and wages, rent, expense. All these expenses have so far not been accounted for. So we are going to continue with a continuation. So starting now from the gross income, We can now get expenses. So, we get expenses. And uh, in a business, the major expense, you can start with the salaries and wages. Salaries and wages. We can also talk about rent, which is a major expense. Rent expense. We can also talk about carriage outward. And I'm going to explain what is carriage outward. This is and how to differentiate it from carriage inward. 
Current you know, are the one who got the patent and you are current to your organization in work. Current job to one is when you carry goods for your customers. For example, you buy a mat a customer buys a mattress and you carry the mattress to their premises, you deliver a good. A customer refills a gas and you carry the gas up to their premises. Now that is carriage outward. So that one is an expense. Carriage outward. We are also going to have discount allowed. Why do you give your customers discount? It is an expense to the business. We can also have increase in provision for doubt students. Again, as we say, this is an end of year adjustment whereby you make a provision every year for the amount that you think is not recoverable from your data. Because anytime you lend people money, you know some of them may not pay, so you make a provision. And if the provision increases from one year to the other, it means that uh, the money you are not going to recover is increasing, meaning it is an expense. While we say that decrease is an income, meaning you are recovering the money. But then it continues to increase the provision for doubt to death, that is an expense. So we are going to have here increase in provision. Of double to death. Increase in provision of double to death. Then another expense would be bad death. Bad death. Now, the difference between provision and bad death is that bad death is absolutely not going to be paid or received. In this case, you mean maybe the customer has died, the customer has become bankrupt. The customer has uh, fallen out of business, therefore they have no ability to pay the money that they owe you, therefore you have to write it off as a bad debt. So this one means that the money has no hope to be recovered. So that is an expense. We may also have depreciation. So this is the loss in value of the fixed asset. A motor vehicle through usage suffers wear and tear. Plant and machinery, they suffer depreciation due to usage, even exposure to weather conditions, like uh, when you keep your motor vehicles outside and there is all this sun, and they may end up getting depreciation in the form of uh, all the rain and getting rust. All those Loss of value of asset is what we categorize as depreciation. Again, there are methods of computing depreciation that we are going to cover in end of year adjustments. Where we say we can compute depreciation using the straight line method, the reducing balance method, the sum of digits method, and so on. So that is another expense. You may also have um, other expenses like heating and lighting. Heating and lighting. This is electricity, power is used in the organization. You may also have um, other expenses. You can uh, call them like stationary. Stationary. Remember, do not categorize stationary as assets because they are two days uh, in a very limited time. Stationary and postage. And, all, and so forth. So I'm going to assume that these are representative of most of the expenses in a business. There may be other expenses, other sundry expenses. So when you get the total of all these expenses, you're going to subtract the total. You subtract the total of the expenses from the gross income to determine whether the organization is making either a net profit or a loss. So if the answer is positive, it is a profit. If the answer is negative, it is a loss. And that is how you compute whether your business is making profit or loss. And by preparing what you have called the trading profit and loss account, also called the income statement. And this is done every year. And that is why we say you should not be excited about the top line, which is the sales. You should be more excited about the bottom line, which is the net profit or the loss. Because you may make millions of sales, 
but depending on how many expenses your business is incurring, you may end up with very little in profit. So I'm going now to look at how you prepare a balance sheet or a statement of financial position. How do you know the worth of your business? How do you know how much your business is worth? And once you know how much your business is worth, how do you explain how you got that wealth? So that is by preparing a statement of financial position, also called a balance sheet. And the format is as follows. So you have a balance sheet. Also called statement of financial position. So we are going to use three columns in this case. The first column represents the cost for at least the fixed asset. The second one is the accumulated depreciation. And the third column is the net book value. Net book value. So this categorization is for the fixed asset or what you call non-current asset. Non-current asset. So non-current assets are those assets that can be used for a long period of time in an organization and they suffer depreciation other than land which appreciates and it is also a fixed asset. So we are going to put maybe two or three just to represent all the others. We can have a plant and machinery. This includes all the motor vehicles. They are in plants and machineries. And then we can have land and buildings. Just to represent others. We can have land, we can have buildings. So we are saying that you categorize all your fixed assets in this category. So as a business, you identify which are all my long-term assets. I have land, I have a building, which is the premises, if you are not renting it. I have motor vehicles and you list all the motor vehicles. And all the assets that you have that can be used for a long period of time. The next item is to represent the cost of those assets. The reason why you use the cost and not the market value is because of uh, the accounting principle that is called historical cost principle. That assets are recorded at their historical cost. That is the amount of money that was used or sacrificed to acquire them. Historical cost is used because it is provable. You can prove it is verifiable. And uh, it is not subjective to manipulation. If you were to use the market value, then that would be a loophole for manipulation in accounting because we would keep on changing the figures in the balance sheet either to promote our welfare so that we look more wealthy or to reduce our welfare. So in this case, we are going to use the cost of the asset here. In the second column, we are going to show the depreciation on those assets. Since the day they were acquired up to this year, that is why that depreciation is accumulated for a period of time. So the depreciation on the assets. The reason I am putting them in bracket is because we are subtracting. We are saying cost, we subtract depreciation, we get the net book value. We get the net book value. And then we require a total of the net book value. So that is the end of uh, the fixed asset. We move forward in uh, the organization and our other assets are called current assets. So we go to the second category, which is current assets. Current assets. These ones are uh, convertible into cash within a period of one year. That is, uh, you can easily and quickly convert them into cash. So we are going to start with cash as well, because cash is already cash, and it is a current asset. You can have either cash in hand or cash at bank. 
So you yes, think here you can have cash in hand, cash at bank, both of them are current assets. So we put how much money do we have in the bank. Now guys, we are using the middle column just as a matter of format so that we arrange our work. It no longer means that this is depreciation, this is just a matter of format that you are using there. So So we can proceed. Other current assets that we have is debtors. And I also appreciate that everybody here knows what is debtors because debtors, these are the people who owe you money. In fact, when you meet them, you think about your money. And we have seen that uh, because we are prudent accountants in uh, regard to the prudent concept, we are only going to put the debtors that can be recovered. Therefore, we are going to make adjustments for bad debt. And you're also going to make an adjustment for provision for doubtful debt, those that we are not sure whether they're going to pay. So we are going to say it's better, but minor provision for doubtful debt. provision for doubtful debt to get the answer. And that represents the data that can be recovered in an organization. So we also going to have a stock. Another name for stock is inventory. Inventory. I should also have mentioned that another name for data is trade receivables. So if you come across trade receivables, know that we are referring to data. So we have stock or inventory. Also note that the stock or inventory we are talking about is the stock at the end of the year. Because a balance sheet is prepared at the end of the year. So it's the closing stock or the stock at the end of the year. The one that we have not yet sold is the one that we are talking about here. It's the stock to place in the balance sheet. Another item would be prepayment. If there is any amount that you have prepaid, that is an expense prepaid before it is incurred. For example, you have paid rent in advance, the rent of this year and the rent of next year. The component that belongs to next year is an asset to us because the rent of that year has not yet been incurred. So any prepaid expense is an asset. The amount prepaid, the amount prepaid is an asset. Then uh, you will also have accrued revenue. In this case, that means that there is a work that you have done, but you have not yet received the money. That is the accrued revenue. It also represents a current asset. So you can get the total of all the current assets. Then we are going to move forward and look at the current liabilities that are payable within a period of one year. Once you receive this money from the current assets, you have to pay for the current liabilities. You also owe other people, and they should be paid within a period of one year. And that has to be accounted for. So, we come to current liabilities. What are the current liabilities? Current liabilities, for example, you have creditors. Or what you call trade payables? Trade payables. These are the creditors. We are going to use the first column as a matter of just arrangement. So you have trade payables or creditors and to be paid within a period of one year. You have bank overdraft. These are short term loans. Bank overdraft. That is a short-term loan. 
and all the sorts of loans. We also have approvals of approved expenses. This is where, for example, you have not been able to pay at the end year all your expenses. For example, you have not paid some salaries, you have not paid part of the rent at the end of the year. Those amounts that are outstanding of those expenses are the ones that we are calling accrued expenses. They have not yet been paid at the end of one year. So when you are doing your end of year, you are preparing the balance sheet, you have to ask yourselves which expenses have I not been able to pay, which have been left outstanding. And these are the ones you are calling accrued expenses. Another item is unearned revenue. So some of your customers may have paid you in advance for you to deliver some goods to them. Imagine you are doing a service business where you are baking some cake. Some customers have come to you they have paid in for the cake, but you have not yet baked the cake, but you have received the money. This is an earned revenue. The reason we say it is an earned is because you have not extended the effort. You have not delivered the commodity that they ordered. Therefore, at the end of the year, you are closing the year, you have to think of the money you have received for which you have not yet worked for, for which you have not extended effort, for which you have not delivered the product. Therefore, those money are your liabilities because you have not yet done the work and therefore they are called an earned revenues. And they have to be accounted for here as current liability. So the total of this you bring here, you subtract so that you say current assets minus current liability. So this is current asset, this is current liability. You subtract, you say current assets minus current liability. The answer what you get is called working capital and you bring the answer here because you want to continue here and add. So the answer you get there, you have called it working capital, this, and you add to the net asset, you get um, the total there called net asset. So that our answer is called net asset. Yeah. So that is one part of the balance sheet where you have just accounted for for all your assets. You have accounted for for part of your liabilities, which are the current liabilities. But now you have to explain how did you get or how did you arrive at these wealth. So we have to prepare a section that is called finance by section. I hope it is fit here. So you show how did you finance? Finance by what? How did you finance this? Or how do you get this wealth or this asset? So finance by it is given by number one, capital. You started with capital. How much did you invest in the business? The money you brought into the business. Then you let drawings. How much have you drawn? Because you may have invested money. But you have been withdrawing and drawings, as I said at the beginning, it will also be that you are taking some goods for personal use. That means you are withdrawing from the business, the capital you invested. So drawing may be cash, drawing, it may be drawings in form of commodities by taking some of the goods. And therefore the total of all those drawings have to be accounted for. Here you subtract from your capital. Profit, then you add the profit that you have been making here so that it represents part of your financing. That means that you have been reinvesting the money that you have made. So you add net profit and that is another part of the financing and finally you have what you call non-current liabilities. Non-current liabilities are liabilities that are payable for a long period of time. They are long-term loans, including debentures. <coughs> so finally, you have non-current liabilities, which is long-term loan. Thank you.
the total of the financed by section, that total is called capital employed. And that is how you prepare your balance sheet. So this tutorial is uh, very helpful for those people who are doing accounting uh, and you have to do financial statements of a sole trader. And uh, the financial statement of even of a um, partnership, part of it is covered because the income statement is the same. But we are going to advance more on the partnership, other aspects of the partnership. So that marks the end of that presentation on how to prepare financial statement. But for you to be able to do financial statement, you have to know what are called end of year adjustments, which I'm going to cover in my next tutorial, which is the part of the working that you have to do. Before you prepare the final statement, Part of those end of the adjustment we have spoken about in our tutorial is depreciation. We have talked about prepay, prepay expenses. We have talked about accrued expenses. We have also talked about provision for doubtful debt. We have also talked about an end of year adjustment, which is an earned revenue, an earned revenue. We have talked about accrued revenue. And those are the end of the adjustments that I'm going to cover in our next tutorial because they are very important when you are preparing the statement of financial position. After which now we can be able to do a question that I'm going to provide as a PDF for you to be able to follow as a recover on the working and finally on preparing the financial statements. Thank you.